Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cloud Adventures. My name is Sara. I am a Senior Solutions Architect at AWS. And today, we are joined by Thomas, CTO of Omega Coders. Thomas, would you like to quickly introduce yourself and tell us more about Omega Coders? So, hi, I'm Thomas. I'm the CTO of Omega Coders. And Omega Coders is a web development agency that creates uh, SaaS solutions for their end customers. Thanks for introducing yourself. Um, Thomas, can you tell us more about the architecture of your platform and the services that you use and the benefits that you encounter by using those services? Yeah. So for all of our projects, we thrive to or we aim to use everything as serverless as possible. What do I mean by as serverless as possible? Well, we don't want anyone maintaining uh, in virtual machine. We don't want anybody having to I don't know, do a manual uh, main replica failover on MySQL, for example. So for us, and, and most of our applications, and most of our architectural overviews, ECS Fargate actually plays a crucial part of it. It's, it's the heart of our application. Um, we use it for web containers. We can use it for uh, backend workers. It doesn't matter. Anything that you can build in a Docker container can be shipped to ECS Fargate. Uh, it can be uploaded on, on the ECR repository. And it basically starts running. For our development team, that's super easy as well, because the only thing they need to do is create their code. They have to specify CPU, memory, maybe a subnet if they want to. If they don't want to, then it just takes the default subnet that we specified. And that's it. You can make it as difficult as you want, or you can make it as easy as you want. Or you can just go drive in the middle. That's perfectly fine as well. And then besides ECS Fargate, we use uh, Aurora, which is has been a lifesaver. I remember in the past where engineers had to wake up at night because uh, my SQL database crashed, and they had to do a main replica failover in the middle of the night. I mean, I've been woken up quite a few times because of this, and there are more fun things to do than with the sleepy hat waking up and, and trying to fix in my SQL uh, server, for instance. That's so happy that's part of the past right now. Other services you use are DynamoDB, which works perfectly fine as well. I mean, it scales automatically up, down. It doesn't matter. You can just do as many these requests you want, uh, as many write requests you want. It, it just keeps on working. Same with Elastic Cache. Uh, and then uh, other things we're using is, of course, S3. I think S3 was the first service we ever used on AWS. Well, not only for Omega coders. I think it's for a lot of companies. S3 was the first service they ever started using. Um, it's super easy to store everything in there. In combination with CloudFront, we actually store most of our user images in there, for example, as well. So if a user uploads a picture, they can either upload it via the web application, or they can send an email to SES, incoming emails, for example, and then the image gets stored to S3, and they can view that image, can be reviewed, can do whatever they want. Other things that are out there are SNS, uh, which is great for sending notifications. Uh, other, we can subscribe listeners to it, and then they can do their own actions to it as well. SQS as a queuing system. Um, in the past, we actually did our queuing via a MySQL database. So basically, you insert, insert, reads, and reads. Uh, MySQL doesn't like a lot of reads and constant writes and deletes on the same table. It's a bit stupid as well to use as a queuing system. And SQS is, is, is perfect for that. And you can specify if it needs to be a FIFO queue or a normal queue. Works flawlessly. And recently, we also started using Kinesis. Um, it's something that we wanted to try out for quite a long time. but it took a while for it to be available as a serverless solution. Um, we tried it out on an EC2 machine in the past, but it just was a lot of hassle keeping it running and maintaining it. So we're like, well, just wait until AWS fixes something, and then, then we can still use it. So I think it got launched a couple of years ago, maybe one or two years ago, and then we immediately jumped onto it. We tried it, and it works perfectly fine for us as well. Uh, in fact, in combination with Glue and then with moving all our data into Parquet and S3, it makes sure that we can use QuickSight now for our data analytics tool. Um, so yeah, I think keyword is serverless. Um, if there is no maintenance on it, we're more likely to try it. Uh, and if there is maintenance on it on EC2 machine, then we most likely will just ask you guys to make something serverless or help us setting it up and, and just yeah distribute that maintenance to AWS. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, you mentioned a few services that are serverless, as you currently say it. Um, can you tell me more about what were the benefits from a technical perspective by adopting and using serverless services? From a technical perspective, as mentioned before, it's like 
not having to wake up to fix anything. Uh, in the past, we easily had like 10 or 20 alerts per week to actually call somebody up over in the weekend to fix something. While now, it all goes automatically. I mean, if an Aurora database is, let, let's say, in distress, it doesn't happen anymore with serverless Aurora. It just scales up, and that's it. Out of disk space, I never had it happen anytime anymore. You just specify your boundaries, and if all goes within parameters, it just keeps on running. That's super awesome. Fargate, same thing. Um, in the past, when we were on EC2 machines and we were expecting like a large marketing campaign to start, they actually had to call us and tell us, like, hey, guys, we're starting a campaign at, let's say, 1 a.m., 1 p.m. Please make sure that your application is scaled to, to handle this. Well, with Fargate, we just give boundaries. We just say, like, hey, you can start anything anywhere between two and, say, 300 containers and knock yourself out. I mean, if there's 500 unique visitors coming in that day, then Fargate will just scale. If there's only one visitor coming in, then Fargate will scale down again. And end customer is happy because they only pay for what they use. And we are happy because we have a lot less maintenance and we can focus on things that are really important for us, which is going on with new innovations and working on new features for our customers. In the interview with my colleague Thomas, you mentioned the importance of latency for the experience of your end users. Can you tell me more about how you reduced latency by adopting AWS? And what was the impact of, of, on cost along the way? That's an interesting one. So historically, we actually started in one AWS region, I think like most people did. And that's it. We never questioned it. Uh, to be honest, everything was running. We were more than happy. It was fine. Yes, there was high latency. But we thought we could fix it with global accelerators and other things out there. Um, but at some point, we were like, using global accelerators, in our case, was just like a patch. It was not like fixing the original problem. And the original problem is that our end users are not where our data center is. So we made an estimation and we thought like, it's going to be a lot of development work moving everything to another region or making our application multi-region. So we were quite hesitant to do that. Um, we had some convincing from AWS, uh, which helped us, um, mainly helping us understand our bill because we did notice that all the data transfer costs that we were actually paying was because we were hosting, I'm not going to say the wrong data center, but not in the correct data center for our end customers. So. We started on a mission to make sure our multi-tenant application become, be, had multi-region support, basically. So for ECS Fargate, that's easy. We just changed region in our deploy script, and ECS Fargate is there with the load balancers. Perfectly fine. With Route 53, you can distribute uh, by geolocation where your traffic goes to. That's it. Perfect. So that leaves us with our databases and with Open Search and with S3. S3, you can also create region endpoints. So perfectly fine as well. Aurora also allows multi-region support. So we made that switch and like this as well, super easy. DynamoDB has global tables. So by just enabling that and making sure that our application, when it is running in, for example, US East 1 connects to the correct endpoint, fixes that latency problem as well. So all in all, it was quite painless doing the migration, making sure our application now became multi-region supported. So when a customer now wants to create a website, they can just specify where they think most of their target audience will be, or they can make a split, and we can just launch in these different regions. The cost aspect came from the multi-AZ approach. So we were in different availability zones. I think like everybody, right? To increase, increase your redundancy, you're in A, B, C, D, E, E, F, whatever letters there are there. The thing is, when you're Fargate container is running in availability zone B and it's connecting to a database in availability zone C or, or somewhere else, basically, you're also paying for that cost. So we made the change in our application that if it knows that it's running on the availability zone B, then it needs to connect to the endpoint of the database that's also in B. Same for C, same for A. It helped us, first things first, it helped us reduce the latency for our customers by 50%. I think that's super for them. And it reduced our cost by 10%, which is yeah, super for everybody else involved. OK, wow, that's really impressive. Thank you. Um, I have another question, which is, how do you and your teams keep up to date with the AWS service portfolio which, and features, which is ever growing? I'm not going to lie. It's hard. I mean, 
it's not only the constant stream of new services and new features, but it's also like the small patch notes that often can be very important. So if you would have asked me this question like a few months ago, I, I, I didn't have an answer to this. I mean, you were just looking at Twitter and going to AWS summits and just seeing here and there on LinkedIn posts, whatever is happening. But we actually went uh, to one of the AWS summits and we talked to other customers and, and some of them had the same problems and some of them actually had solutions and we tried to make our own solution kind of out of it. What we did is we now have a Slack channel and basically we subscribe to an AWS RSS feed and every new feature or every new bug fit, fix, patch, whatever it is there gets posted in that channel. It's only like seven messages a day. I mean, everybody reads more than seven messages per day on Slack a lot more. So it's manageable. You can see an overview. The important part is that everybody of my team, and it doesn't matter who, if you're just starting or you're a senior developer, anybody of the team can add an emoji to a certain thing. It can be a patch note, a new feature, something they find important for one of our customers or for Omega Coders on itself, or just for them to learn about. It might be a feature that we are not using, but they want to use in the future it can be tagged. And then once in a while, once we have a few, we actually have a meeting with everybody that is involved with that. And we discuss it like, hey, there's a new Aurora version. Should we upgrade? Yeah, let's upgrade, but first to this server and this server, and we come up with a migration plan. Or there is a new feature like Kinesis Serverless. And it's like, oh, where can we use this? Can we try to help a customer with this, with something like that? And for now, it's been six months. It's, it's working rather well, so I'm quite happy with it. Wow, I love the idea. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know your company has been used in and leveraging AWS for many years, and I'm actually curious to know, um, given your extensive experience with AWS, what are the lessons learned and also the improvements that you were able to actualize throughout your cloud adoption journey? Something that you would like to share with our audience today. Well, there are a lot of lessons learned. So if I have to pick one, uh, in my opinion, it's the most important one, is that accept that your architecture is never finished. We often have customers come to us like saying like, hey, we want you to refactor our application like this, or we want you to upgrade a certain PHP framework to another version, but they never question the architecture. They're just happy that it's running on a virtual machine somewhere in a data center. They usually don't even know where it is running. They just know that they have to pay an amount and ship a server every once in a while. But evolve it. I mean, follow with the trends. If you're not yet on AWS because the amount of services is overwhelming, just go on EC2. It's so much easier from EC2 to go to other services because you're already in that ecosystem then starting from scratch and usually shipping your current machine, your current virtual machine to an EC2 machine is, is, is pretty effortless, pretty painless. So in our company, everybody and, and really everybody is invited to question the architecture, ask questions. Every new person that joins can have a talk with whoever and tries to convince like, hey guys, maybe we should go to this and this and this and this. To give a concrete example, we actually have this feature on, on our websites, well, on one of our customers' websites, where I think when I joined the company, we hosted it in MySQL. Then AWS launched DynamoDB. So we were like, hey, this is a lot more convenient for this particular feature because it's putting like 60% of the load on MySQL is coming from this feature. We moved to DynamoDB. And it was running fine. It was awesome. And then we made some changes to the feature, and MongoDB was out there. And we were like, well, maybe now MongoDB is better. We made the switch to MongoDB. We went back and forth a few times, and recently we actually moved back um, to DynamoDB again. With a stop, short stop at MySQL again, but then again, feature requirements changed. So again, now at DynamoDB. So it should evolve, it should grow, it should make the changes. I mean, always keep on questioning it. Thank you. I find it very interesting that you had the opportunity, the ability to quickly uh, evolve your architecture. And I think uh, by adopting serverless services, you were able to do that uh, quickly and without an impact on the business. So that, that is great. Thank you for sharing. Um, given your extensive experience using AWS in production, do you have any recommendation for other AWS customers like yourself? 
I would say know what's out there. I mean, AWS has over 200 services, so it's, it's sometimes very hard to get started with it. Um, know what's out there, check out all the services. You don't have to check them out in detail. You don't have to know what DynamoDB does exactly. Just know it's a managed NoSQL database. That's it. If you have a feature or a potential feature that you're thinking about that might be useful for DynamoDB, then you can start looking into it. Same for Kinesis, same for QuickSight. Don't expect you to know all services from the beginning. It's impossible. I mean, we've been at it for over a decade, and, and, and we're not even able to manage all these services. And start with EC2. I mean, there's no shame in just having EC2 machines on AWS. And as soon as your application is on EC2, you can start by picking bits by bits. You can move to S3, you can use SES, and you can use a database, a managed database. That's usually where it starts. And if you're still doubting, reach out. I mean, there are plenty of community forums out there. There is Amazon IQ that helps us often as well. There is you, basically, that helps us from day to day. If you have a question and if we have the feeling that figuring it out ourselves will take too long, then we just reach out and you guys give us all the tools needed to yeah, have us bootstrap, basically. Thank you so much for sharing this story with us today. I found it super insightful. And to you, thank you for watching. And I hope to see you at the next episode.